Greetings. I'm so glad you guys are joining us today, and my prayer is, is that you're doing well. I know that uh, the kind of isolating ourselves is still going on, and I think that uh, as you continue to be cautious and, and, and exercise your wisdom, uh, just I want you to know that we miss you. And uh, I don't know that we can, we can uh, separate from that, uh, that need for each other, that need to be in together, that need for interaction. Um, God set up his church uh, to be together for a reason, and so we miss you, and we hope to see you real soon, all right? Why don't we pray as we begin this morning, uh, and uh, just, just want you to know that, that uh, if you have access to um, the, the, uh, our homepage, it's a great place for just to kind of keep track of what's happening ahead, and we've got a couple things happening. We've got a yard sale coming up with, for the ladies' ministry. Uh, and we're taking donations for that. They've got a fall event called I Am Beautiful that they're trying to raise money for. And so if you, if you have things that you would be willing to donate, give the church a call and we, will, uh, we can even come get them for you, all right? So just let us know that. Also, um, a few changes with our clothing giveaway that's coming up in mid-August uh, due to the supplies uh, that we've, we've struggled to get. Um, we're just going to do the, it's not going to be a clothing giveaway, it's going to be a school supply and backpack giveaway. Uh, next year our plan is we'll be back up and running, we hope, but the sales just haven't been there and some of our people that have, have uh, been volunteering to shop uh, haven't been able to do that either. And so uh, we just, we've decided that um, rather than have a bunch of tables with hardly anything on them, we still want to, we want to be, a pre, be present in our community. So uh, we'll be inviting people to come out for, with school supply, to pick up school supplies and backpacks, but this year that's about all we'll be able to do. And so I just encourage you to be praying for, praying for that, that uh, outreach into our community, all right? Um, our youth ministry is going to be having a camp coming up at the end of July, just uh, Thursday through Friday, the last, the last weekend in July, the first weekend in, in August, and uh, uh, there'll be paintballing, they'll be floating the Joe, they're going to be hiking up to Crystal Lake, they're going to be fishing, they're going to be playing on the, on the river, uh, boating, that kind of thing. And so if that's something you'd like to be part of, like to help out with, please give us a call and uh, uh, let us know. We'll get, you, we'll get you hooked up, okay? Um, other than that, I think well, let's, let's go to prayer, all right? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we, as we take some time to look at your word, I pray that you would help us to see and help, us, help me to see even just, just beyond that first glance that as we slow down and, and look at your word, that you want to talk to us, that you want to you work in our hearts. And so I pray that you would do that, that, that we would we just invite you to, to sit down with us right now and, and talk to us. Help us to know you. Help us not to just look at your word as, as a source to, to get answers, have our questions answered, but a source to, to, to build a relationship with you. That it is more than just a book. So I, I pray you'd help us to see today what you want us to see. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me do just a fast review. Last week, we looked at the end of chapter 6. Jesus was just finishing up his Sermon on the Plain, uh, and he was, uh, uh, he was just kind of he was bringing the, the thing all together again, all right? And he uses this illustration. He says, Lord, Lord, why do you say, Lord, Lord, and, and don't do what I say? And then he talked about what it looks like to do what he says. It's like a, a builder who, who digs down deep and and builds his foundation on solid rock. And, he, and that's what he's talking about is, is that in our lives, that, that if we will build our foundation on him, it will withstand the storms. And, and the thing we talked about was, is, you know, that's a promise. That's a good thing to have a home that, that isn't, uh, isn't going to be washed away, isn't going to deteriorate when the storms of life hit, because the storms come. They, they always will. And he promises that if we will build our life on him, it will withstand the storms. And so will we allow him to be our architect, our engineer, our builder, our contractor, and that we would we'd do the digging and we'd follow his or- direction, his orders. So now let's go ahead and take an, the, the next 
step. Let's move to chapter 7. Now, what I want to challenge us with as we begin here is, you know, th- the numbers, the chapters, the, the verses, those were added later. And so sometimes what happens is, is when, we, when we take that as, as, well, this is how they divided it up, this is how the author divided up the Scripture, then what we, what we miss is uh, sometimes there are some passages that are connected there are chunks of Scripture that are more connected than we realize. And so uh, as we look at this, I want us just to, I want to kind of erase the fact that this is chapter 7. Chapter 7 just helps us to find where we're at. Verse 1 just helps us where to start. And uh, we're just going to read the first 10 verses in chapter 7, all right? So this is what Luke tells us. He says this, when, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. Now, he was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. With soldiers under me, I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at at him. And turning to the crowd, excuse me, let me back up. When Jesus heard this, there we go. He was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So as we begin to look at this passage, I have a question for you, and I just want you to take a moment. I'm going to pause as you process this. The question is, is what are the amazing parts of the story? What do you think is the amazing pieces to this story? Now, it's not a trick question. I just want us to pause for a moment to think through this. And so, as I did, and I know I'm just kind of rushed you you a little bit here, but I think one of the things that that stood out to me was, well, this faith, right? The man's faith. That was the amazing part. I mean, amazed Jesus. So we should probably go, man, that that, that centurion's faith was, was, was pretty amazing. Let me tell you, last night I spent time with my, when, my, my Wednesday group, just a small crowd, but we often will talk about these things, and I kind of bounce questions off of them, and, and uh, they listed off a few things that they thought were amazing. The fact that, um, that some of the Jewish elders were, cared about the, the centurion, that was amazing. And you know what was really strange? The fact that Jesus healed the man without it even being present was left off the list until almost very last. It's almost as though, it was almost as though when I read it, I was like, did I dismiss that? Oh yeah, there goes Jesus again, healing somebody. I hope we never get to that place where we stop being amazed at Jesus. If we will recognize what he does here, there should be something in us of awe, amazement, of wonder, Jesus healed the guy just by saying the word. He didn't have to see him. He didn't have to go to him. He just said, yep, he's healed. So now as I read this passage, let me ask you another question. As we we prepare to kind of study it a little bit, let me ask you, how do you interpret this passage? I mean, what is the, as you've read it, I I don't know if you've read it very many times. I've heard it. I've heard the story many times, the faith of the centurion. And so how do you interpret it? What do you pull from that as, as, as you kind of, as we read through it even, what do you think what the point was? I mean, as I read through it, I, th- I would say, well, I thought the point was faith, right? Uh, that, 
um, the centurion had incredible faith. So I would read that as, wow, that, um, that's a challenge. That, that I begin to look at myself and I go, do I, do I have enough faith? I mean, do I, do I want to have faith like the centurion? I do want to have faith like the centurion. I want to have fa- faith that Jesus goes, that is, a, that is great faith. I mean, I would love to shock Jesus. I, I would love to have the faith that causes him to answer my prayers. I mean, let's, that's the truth. I would, I would love to have faith that when I ask Jesus for something, that he would, he would do it. I've admitted this before, and I wish I, I was done with it, but I'm not. That there is still something in me that, that I, if I could just figure out how to, how to make Jesus do what I want him to. Now, you might sit there, and the minute I say, the, say it in that way, it sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? How, how do I manipulate Jesus to do what I want? I mean, that's, the, that's what it really boils down to. But look, we, we do this. I think even some of you might do this. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I need to get so-and-so to pray for me because God seems to answer their prayers, right? We call them prayer warriors, don't we? We, we go, well, who can I get to pray for me that, that, that somehow that, 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 that when they talk to God, God's going to listen to them because I don't know if he listens to me. And that's what, the, that's what the centurion did, kind of. He picked the elders and went to ask Jesus. But some of us, if we were honest, we'd want to figure out the secret to getting God to give us what we ask for. And we read this story, and all of a sudden what we see in it is, ah, it's faith. That's what's missing. That's, that's what will make God do what I want him to, is if I just believe that he'll do it. But I want us to just, I want us to look at this story with maybe just a little different view. All right? And I'm not saying that that the, the, that the centurion's faith wasn't remarkable, because it absolutely was. And I'm not saying that God doesn't care about our faith, and I'm not saying that, that faithful people, people with great faith, don't get their prayers answered. But I think there's a, another layer here that I want us to see. So let's do this. Number one thing that I noticed is, is the context is important. I mentioned the, ch- the chapters and the verses were added later just to kind of help us to find s- stories in the Scripture, to help us reference it. But context is critical here. So context. Listen, Luke tells us this. When Jesus had finished saying all of, these, all of this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. Now let's pause. Let's just stop right there. Did anybody just kind of read right over that and just think, okay, yeah, so Jesus gets done there and he goes to Capernaum. Why would Luke place this story here, except for probably that's exactly what happened, but, but, but why would he say this, those words? When he had finished saying all these things to the people that were listening, remember what Jesus said as he was preaching his sermon on the, on the plane? He said, but to you who are listening... And he goes on to tell them some challenging things. And then he said, then Luke tells us when Jesus had finished saying all of this, all of this, what is all of this? We'll look at that. To the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. It's easy to to dismiss the placement of this passage. But Luke places this immediately following the Sermon on the Plain. And he ends into Capernaum. Now, Capernaum, uh, just for your own understanding or own information, Capernaum was very, uh, a very familiar town for Jesus. Uh, probably Peter was from Capernaum because his mother-in-law lived there. Remember, Jesus went, after he was in the synagogue and he healed somebody with an evil spirit, he went to Peter's house and he healed his mother-in-law. 
Um, Jesus was visiting Capernaum when he called Matthew. Uh, when Jesus was in Nazareth and he was visiting his hometown, in his interaction with, with the people from his hometown, pretty much they told him, we want to see you perform miracles like you've done in Capernaum. So Jesus was very familiar with Capernaum. He had spent time there. In fact, some would even say this is kind of his center of operation, Capernaum was. So he was, he was a familiar person to the city. And f- immediately following his sermon, he heads into the city. See, what we should be able to say is, is man, I, maybe when we put this into context, we begin to see a little different picture of what's happening here. Is there any connection with what Jesus was, has just said and what happens here? Is there any connection with what Jesus was just teaching his disciples and what we see with the centurion? See, Jesus was teaching his disciples what a disciple looks like. He told them a disciple. A disciple is one who loves his enemy. A disciple is one who does good to those who hate them. A disciple is one who prays for those who mistreat them, who turns the other cheek, who lends without expecting anything in return. A disciple is one who doesn't judge and shows mercy. A disciple can be picked out by their fruit because good fruit comes from a good tree, bad fruit comes from a bad tree. These are the things that he had just finished saying. And he had just finished saying, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Now, let me pause for a moment right there, okay? Context. Why do you call me supreme in authority, and you don't do what I say? Do do you recognize, is it possible that that this, this centurion is, is a picture of what Jesus has just been teaching? The centurion is the example of a disciple that Jesus has just been teaching about. Had we noticed that? So let's do this. Let's use that idea to examine the story a little bit differently. So as we look at this story, maybe instead of just see, seeing Jesus answering the centurion's request and, and that you know, we need to have more faith. Maybe let's look at this story as, um, as a in-the-flesh example of a disciple. Now, really, this is where it becomes challenging because if we know anything about the centurion, what we know is, is he wasn't even from the Jews. And so here Jesus goes right into Capernaum and the example of a disciple is not even part of the family. So let's look at the centurion for a moment, okay? Number two, the centurion. Uh, he's not a Jew, okay? Um, we actually don't know his origin. We don't know what country he was from. Uh, we would, some sources say, well, he was a Roman soldier, but it doesn't mean he was Roman. He may have been uh, Samaritan. Some th- scholars have thought that. He may be from uh, just a, a surrounding territory. Somebody that, that Rome had conquered. He was somehow under Roman rule, and his job was to carry out Rome's wishes. He may have worked for, for Herod, but, but it was Rome's rule. He was carrying out Rome's wishes. All right? So... As we take a moment to look at the centurion, these were these soldiers that, that were well thought of by other soldiers. Within the ranks, within the military, these are the guys that, um, that worked their way up through the ranks. But these soldiers in, in, in Israel especially, they were not well thought of. They were hated. They were the presence of another ruling empire, forcing them into their mold. 
a centurion's job basically is they were stationed in in the cities of in the Roman world where where their job was number one is to to maintain peace, okay, keeping the peace. So they were to carry out Roman peace, not Jewish peace, but Roman peace. So whatever whatever kingdom Rome had conquered, these centurions were placed there to maintain Roman peace so that an uprising wouldn't happen, so that, so that Rome's rule was honored. Now, what we also see is, is so their jo- number one job as a centurion in those times, stationed there with, with his forces, uh, was to keep, maintain Roman peace. The second job was is to ensure or enforce the collection of taxes. Which I think is really interesting. So the centurion's job was to, um, to enforce Roman rule and to ensure that, the, that taxes were collected. By the way, Matthew was a tax collector in Capernaum. So is it possible there was a connection there, that at least there was some familiarity? Oh, absolutely. I'm sure of it. All right? But, but as we look at this centurion, here's what I want us to know, is, is that he was, he was in charge of about 80 to 100 uh, soldiers. Okay? I know you probably thought, well, it's 100 soldiers because it's centurion. But it, it was, there was some flexibility there for between 80 and 100 soldiers. And they had worked their way up through the ranks, okay? So a, a centurion had worked their way up to, through the ranks, which means, which means they were battle-proven. They were strong. They were experienced. And they were disciplined. They were... They were a soldier's soldier. They were manly men. I mean, if you needed a picture of what a man was, this centurion is the type of person. He had reached to basically his highest rank. Very similar to our, our military, right? So these guys knew how to fight. And they had gained the respect of the troops because of their history. This is the guy that is dealing with Jesus. So he was, he was in charge of many men. He was a man who understood authority from both sides. Okay? He, he understood from above and he understood authority from below. In other words, he had men above, people above him that he was ordered to carry out orders. And he had men below him that he told to go and do. And, he, and they did. He was submerged in a life of authority. Orders were given to him, and he carried them out. Officers officers above him expected obedience, almost as though when the order was sent, they didn't question whether it was going to happen or not. He also had the understanding that when he gave an order, it was carried out. Did you hear what he said? He says, when I give an order, when I tell you to do something, you do it. Remember what Jesus' words were just a moment ago? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, supreme in authority, and you don't do what I say. Could it possibly be there's a connection between this centurion and what Jesus had just been talking about in chapter 6? See, that is a picture of an order given but not followed. What Jesus said there, that's a picture of an order given that's not followed. Since the centurion's experience is, look, I tell something to, somebody to do something, and it happens. That's the way authority works. The centurion is the one that's teaching us how authority functions. And Jesus is questioning his disciples concerning authority. It's a significant contrast between what he says to his disciples and what we see in the centurion. The centurion sure seems like a a beautiful picture of a disciple. So let's move on. The the centurion, he he 
sent Jewish elders to Jesus. All right? Jewish elders. Let's not read just over that real fast. All right? These are the guys who were the Jewish Jews. <laughs> okay? They were, they were the rule keepers. They were the ones that would have hated the centurions the most, the Romans the most. And these are the guys that, that he sends. And what do, they, what do they do? Do they go to Jesus and they go, well, oh, the centurion's forcing us to come and, and ask you this? No. You hear what they, what they say? What did Luke tell us? They pleaded earnestly. Do you hear the language there? These guys, these guys cared about this guy. They cared about the centurion. What did they say? They said, this man deserves you to do this. They said that he, he loves our nation and he built our synagogue. What would it take for a centurion to get Jewish elders to see him that way? Here's what I think it would take. It would take somebody who loves their enemies, who does good to those who hate them, who prays for those who mistreat them, who lends without expecting anything in return, who turns the other cheek, which is really strange, right, for a centurion to, to be somebody like that. Um, that, that he doesn't judge, that he is merciful. You'd be the judge. What do you think he was like to get a Jewish elder to plead the case before Jesus? Now, as we continue to kind of shape what's happening here, let's, let's now shift our attention to the servant, okay? We looked at the centurion. We kind of looked at the context of it. Now, let's look at the servant. And, and the servant isn't, isn't a major player in this, even though he's the sick one and he's going to be healed, right? But what we, what we read here is, I think there may be a filter that we write, might read this with. Um, In Hebrew days, in, in Jesus' days, what a slave or a servant was within the Jewish community would have been somebody who was like an indentured servant. He had, he had created a debt and he was working it off. But within the, the Hebrew system, in God's plan, every seventh year, all debt was erased. And so a servant usually only served for a maximum of seven years. It depends on you know, where you were at in your debt and if you weren't able to pay it. And so... Um, it may be that as we read this, we might be thinking, oh, well, you know, he was just, you know, he owed the guy some money. He was just a, you know, he was, he was working off his debt. No, the centurion's not a Hebrew. He's not Jewish. He's Roman. He's Roman. He's Roman. Uh, he's working under the Roman system. He upholds the Roman rule. So therefore, a servant to him would have been a tool or a possession. That's it. They didn't see them as, they weren't seen as human, as a person. They were a tool. And when a tool wears out, when a tool stops being effective and stops working, what do we do with tools? We throw them away. An owner, a master, could abuse, could mistreat, they could even kill a servant without any legal ramifications. They weren't considered people. As we look at this story, there is something here that we should recognize that centurion cared about his servant. Do you hear what's happening? Once again, there is this picture that Jesus has just been describing that we're seeing played out within the centurion. But there's something that we don't see in the English language. And it's unfortunate, but if we back up, what we see in verses 2 and 3 of this chapter, of this story, is that um, we're told that the servant, that the, the centurion's servant was sick. All right? And then we're told that the Jewish elders come to Jesus and they say, this man's servant is sick. And the word that we used in, chapter, in verses 2 and 3 is a word that means slave. Okay? Very simple. But we jump down to verse 7. And what we see is, and I want you to notice this, there's some quotes here. 
These are the words of the centurion where he says, my servant. But we see the same word, right? We see servant in 2 and 3, and we see servant in verse 7, but it's not the same word. It is a different word, and the word that the, that the centurion uses, not the word that Luke or, or the Jewish elders use, the centurion uses a word that means child or boy. What, what we should understand is, is when the centurion speaks about his servant, he's not calling him slave. He's calling him his boy, his child, this somebody that he cares deeply for, somebody that he didn't have to care for, somebody that, that the, the society around him said, it's just, he's just a tool. He's just a possession. And yet, what we see is the centurion has this, this love for this servant. So when the centurion is quoted, it means child or boy my boy my child this centurion was unusual he wasn't like most centurions and the last thing i want us to see is number four is is that jesus we want to see jesus's response he was amazed by the faith of the centurion now, as I look at that, I think to myself, okay, so when, when in the story did Jesus decide to heal the, heal the servant? I, mean, I want you to think about it. When do you think it was? Did he decide to heal the servant when he saw the, the, the centurion's faith? I mean, is that the point where he's like, oh, man, look at this centurion's faith. I'm going to heal that boy. Or do you think, is it possible that, that um, Jesus decided to already heal the boy? when the Jewish elders presented the case. I don't think that Jesus would have went with them if he wasn't planning to heal the guy. Matthew gives us somewhat of a different light as, as what we see as Jesus says to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. I want to challenge us to see past that, that layer I want to challenge us to see past the layer of understanding that it was the faith of the centurion that caused the healing. This healing is more than just a result of the centurion's faith. I want us to focus on Jesus' amazement. I want us to zero in on that response. I, I can't help but think to myself, I, I love Jesus' response. There is something inside of me that goes, oh, I want to create that kind of response from Jesus. Now, I realize that we probably can't amaze Jesus now, right? He's in heaven. He sees everything. He's, when he was a man in this situation before the resurrection, yeah, it would have been a little bit easier to, to amaze Jesus possibly. But, but now, I don't know that we can amaze him. But, but within that, what, what I kind of interpret it as is there's a bit of appreciation or enjoyment, almost like a smile from Jesus. Not, not, not so he'll do something for me, but because it pleases him. I hope that what we see is that statement of the faith of the centurion amazed Jesus. What I hope is, is there's something inside of us that we recognize it because the Holy Spirit inside of us should be talking to us like this. Is, isn't that what we want? I mean, doesn't the words that the, when Jesus says he will say, well done, good and faithful servant, now enter my rest, isn't, isn't that idea when he says well done, isn't there something in us that goes, oh, that's what I desire? Not so that he'll do something for me, but because I want his his appreciation. I want him to, I want to do something that he goes, man, I, 
That's wonderful. So as we kind of sift through all of that, we put the lens of Christ formed in me. We, we look at this story of Jesus and we, 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 we talk about the formation of Jesus and how it fits into our lives. Well, for months I've been speaking uh, uh, on this idea of Christ being formed in me, in us, in you. The picture of growth towards Christ-likeness. Okay? The picture of growth towards Christ likeness. When we let go of our attempt to earn God's favor, and instead we surrender to Him and His transforming of our lives. Do you hear the words that I'm saying? Christ being formed in us. is not about earning God's favor. But it's about surrendering to to His transforming power in our lives. It's the growth towards Christ-likeness. It's almost like Him making a conquest of every area of my life. That word conquest captures me. It could sound brutal, but I want us to hear it as there's an authority issue that plays out here. So let's start with this, the invitation. If you have never invited him into your life, I I want to give you an opportunity to do that because that's the beginning of him being formed in us. We talk about it, but if I never give you an opportunity, then we just kind of, you just on the outside kind of listening in. Why don't we let him in on the inside where he can transform us from the inside? We can begin to have him be informed in us. So we're going to do that in a moment, all right? I hope that we can begin to see this centurion as a shining example of what a disciple of Jesus acts like. He loved a people that didn't have to, that he didn't have to love. He cared for a servant in a manner that was unusual. He had, he had to sh- have shown mercy. He had to have given without expecting anything returned. He helped them build the synagogue. He would have absolutely done good to those who hated him because most of the Jews would have hated him. I don't know that there was any other centurion that had done anything like that. But what I believe we need to see today is the connection between Jesus' statement, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? And that connected with these words from Luke. Where he says to Jesus, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant do this and he does it. Those of us who can say he's being formed in me. Those words should be the words that Jesus says about us. We have to recognize when we challenge his authority in our lives, we are putting a halt to his being formed in us. When we do that, we are living into Jesus' question of why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say. He says, why do you do this? But we see the centurion who amazed Jesus because he understood Jesus' authority. He believes in Jesus' authority. He wasn't questioning whether Jesus could do it. He was wondering if he would do it. How many times in our lives, in our daily life, do we question what Jesus is telling us to do? 
The centurion sees the healing of, of his servant, that it stems from Jesus' authority. That's it. He didn't think he had to have more faith. It was about authority. And that's what Jesus has responded to. It's a matter of a command from Jesus that will heal. Not a matter of how do we get him to command it? How do we convince him to do it? It's a matter of Jesus having the ability to exercise his authority. Because we recognize it. To invite him into our lives and to not do what he says is like a man who builds a house on the ground and the torrent washes it away. You know what that is? That's fighting with God's authority. That's a man who doesn't recognize Jesus' authority. How do we bring a smile across Jesus' faith? Maybe by recognizing the authority that he has. Do we ever recognize who we are saying no to? Do you, do you need to repent for not recognizing his authority? Do you need to surrender once again to the God of the universe that has come to live inside of you? As for me, I want Jesus' authority to be unquestioned in my life. That's what I want. And so today, I surrender. So let's close in prayer. And if you've never invited Jesus into your life, I want to invite you to do that now. If you want to have him become, come and be formed in you, then let's invite him in. And if you're sitting here going, man, I, I don't know if I've really recognized my questioning of his authority. I don't know that I've ever really recognized what, what, I, what I am doing. And I want to repent. I want to surrender today. It is, it's one decision to do what he says. So let's pray. Let me just walk through an invitation. Will you just pray a simple prayer of, Lord Jesus, I recognize that you are the supreme authority. You are Lord. And I've learned about you a little bit, but I need to know you. I don't deserve you because I am sin sinful. Would you come into my life? Would you forgive my sins? And would you help me to recognize when I'm fighting against your authority? And would you be formed in me? And for those of us who, who feel like maybe, you know, it's time to surrender once again. Let's pray. Let's repent and surrender. Lord Jesus, the words from the Old Testament ring in my head. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So, Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that, that there are things, there are these places in my life that I can say, uh, I'm not doing what you say here. Oh, 
I'm fighting your authority here. That I look at the centurion and I am challenged. Not to get you to, to figure out a way to get you to do what I want, but I am challenged to see you the way he saw you. And quite frankly, I've kind of become numb to it. So Lord God of the universe, would you forgive me for not functioning within your authority. And I surrender to you today. I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. I will stop doing what you want me to stop doing. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, we're so grateful that you've joined us, and keep in touch with us. Please send us emails, uh, get on Facebook and talk to us, uh, or when you're feeling brave enough, feeling comfortable enough, come see us, okay? We look forward to seeing you. Take care.